Isabel Neville, Duchess of Clarence, is one of the most frequently forgotten women of the Wars of the Roses, and one of history's tragic royal duchesses. Born into one of England's most powerful 15th century families, she was a great heiress, but money would prove no protection from the perils her life would throw at her. Stay tuned to this week's video from History Calling to hear about her scandalous marriage into the York royal family, her terrifying first childbirth experience, the multiple times she had to flee her homeland and go into exile, and the heartbreaks and failed hopes she suffered before her untimely death, which her husband believed was murder. Before we jump in, those of you who saw last week's video will know that it was about Isabel's sister, Anne Neville. I wasn't planning on doing the two sisters' biographies back to back like this, however, the research I did on Anne doubled in many instances as research on Isabel, so I decided to create this video while her story was still fresh in my mind. There is some inevitable overlap in their stories, however, this video is very much from Isabel's point of view, with extra sources added in to better explain her experiences, and other than the section explaining what the Wars of the Roses were, this does not just repeat Anne's video, nor do you need to have seen that video for this one to make sense. They do make good companion pieces though, so you might want to watch Anne's biography after this, and or the other videos I have in my series on the women of the Wars of the Roses. Okay, let's hear about Isabel. Isabel Neville was born at Warwick Castle on the 5th of September 1451. Her father was Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, known to history as the Kingmaker, and her mother was Anne Beauchamp. She was christened at Warwick with her paternal great-aunt Cecily Neville, Duchess of York, as her godmother. Remember that name, as Cecily will be reappearing in an important role later on. Isabel's parents produced only one other surviving child, the aforementioned younger sister Anne, who was also born at the castle in June 1456, and the two girls were therefore wealthy heiresses and would eventually be highly sought after marriage partners. It was at Warwick that Isabel likely spent her earliest years, though given that her father became the captain of Calais in 1456, which was then still under English control, his family may have relocated there soon after Anne's birth. Isabel's life would be shaped by the Wars of the Roses, which had its beginnings in events which took place decades before her birth and which wouldn't finish until nearly ten years after her death. The problems began with Edward III, who had five surviving sons in your face, Henry VIII. This section of the video will recap information given in last week's documentary, so if you're already up to speed on the background to the wars, you might want to skip ahead. By the time Edward died in 1377, his eldest boy, Edward Prince of Wales, known as the Black Prince, was already dead. The throne therefore went to the prince's son, who became Richard II, but he had no children, and so his heir was Edmund Earl of March, a descendant of Edward III's second surviving son, Lionel of Antwerp, Duke of Clarence. However, in 1399, Richard II was deposed by his cousin Henry Bolingbroke, who was the son of Edward III's third son, John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, and his first wife, Blanche of Lancaster. Bolingbroke became Henry IV, and Richard III died soon afterwards, having probably been murdered. Henry IV's eldest son became Henry V, then his son became Henry VI in 1422 at the age of nine months. As this branch of the Plantagenets were descended from Edward III's third son, however, their blood claim on the throne was arguably weaker than the descendants of his second son, Lionel of Antwerp. Lionel's descendant, Edmund Earl of March, was long dead and had had no children, but he had passed his claim to the throne on to the descendants of his sister, Anne Mortimer. She had married her distant cousin, Richard Earl of Cambridge, who was also a descendant of Edward III, this time through his fourth son, Edmund of Langley, Duke of York. So we have the descendants of John of Gaunt, who are known as the Lancastrians, because he was the Duke of Lancaster, and we have the descendants of Lionel of Antwerp and Edmund of Langley, who are known as the Yorks, because Edmund was Duke of York. The Lancastrians hold the throne at the time of Isabel's birth, because Henry IV had seized it but the Yorks have a better blood claim on it because they are descended from an older son of Edward III. 
The idea of roses comes from the fact that one of the badges sometimes used by the House of Lancaster was a red rose, while one of the badges sometimes used by the House of York was a white rose. Isabel was a descendant of John of Gaunt, but that descent was complicated. After the death of his first wife, Blanche of Lancaster, he married again in 1371 to Constance of Castile. They had no surviving sons, but John had a mistress, Catherine Swinford, with whom he had three sons and a daughter between 1372 and 1381. The eldest of these would be the progenitor of the Tudor line, but it was from the daughter, Joan, that Isabel descended. After Constance's death, John of Gaunt finally married Catherine Swinford and had these children retroactively declared legitimate. A later caveat was added by Henry IV, which stipulated that they and their descendants were unable to inherit the throne, though if you see my videos on Margaret Beaufort and her son, Henry VII, you'll know that that caveat ultimately didn't hold. The king at the time of Isabel's birth and during her early childhood was the now adult Henry VI. He and his wife, Margaret of Anjou, had just one child, Edward, Prince of Wales, Born in 1453, during a period of time when his father had suffered a complete mental breakdown and was in a catatonic state. Isabel's father, Lord Warwick, was not on good terms with the royal household, especially Queen Margaret, and was instead a supporter of his uncle by marriage, the Duke of York. This was the husband of Isabel's godmother. York was second in line to the throne after the infant Prince of Wales, and was named Protector of the Realm during the King's incapacitation, and again for three months in late 1455 and early 1456, for reasons which are less clear. He had four sons who survived infancy, Edward, Edmund, George and Richard, three of whom would prove to be instrumental in the direction Isabel's life took. Isabel, much like her sister, is one of those historical figures for whom we have frustratingly little information. I can't even tell you for sure what she looked like. The image of her in a stained glass window is a much later imagining, and the only near contemporary drawing we have of her is the very generic picture you see here from a document called the Roos Rule, now held in the British Library. In this document, however, all the women look pretty much the same as each other, as do all the men. What I can tell you, though, is that most of her life was governed by the decisions made by her father, and only rarely did these make her existence easier. As the Yorks and Lancasters struggled for the throne, Lord Warwick and his father, the Earl of Salisbury, were pulled into the fighting. At the Battle of Ludford Bridge in October 1459, the Yorkist forces suffered a serious defeat, leading Warwick, Salisbury and the Duke of York's eldest son, Edward Earl of March, to flee to Calais, while the Duke himself took his second boy, Edmund Earl of Rutland, and went to Ireland. Isabel and her mother and sister were either already in Calais at this time, or joined their menfolk there soon afterwards. The following July, however, the Yorks succeeded in deposing Henry VI and taking him prisoner, while Queen Margaret of Anjou and her son had to flee to Scotland. At the end of October, an act of accord was passed stating that upon Henry's death, Isabel's great-uncle, the Duke of York, would become king, and the throne would then pass to his children, rather than the young Prince of Wales. Things didn't go that smoothly, however. York and his second son, Edmund, were both killed at the Battle of Wakefield just two months later, with Isabel's grandfather, Lord Salisbury, taken prisoner and killed shortly afterwards at Pontefract Castle. Despite these Lancastrian gains, though, the supporters of King Henry couldn't hold on to power, even after they defeated Isabel's father at the Second Battle of St Albans on the 17th of February 1461, and freed the king from Warwick's custody. The Duke of York's oldest son, the 18-year-old Edward Earl of March, who was technically the Duke of York now, though history never refers to him by this title, managed to take London, where he was declared King Edward IV on the 4th of March. King Henry, Queen Margaret and their son withdrew into Scotland. Isabel had remained in France during these treacherous months, but with Yorkist control over England now secure, she, her mother and her little sister returned to England and set up home in Middleham Castle. It's very hard to glimpse the girl in the records, however. She was at the reburial of her grandfather, Lord Salisbury, at Bisham Abbey in February 1463. He'd originally been interred in the Friary at Pontefract, 
and in September 1465 she attended the ostentatious celebrations for the enthronement of her paternal uncle, George Neville, as Archbishop of York. She sat with her sister and their father's cousin, the almost 13-year-old Richard Duke of Gloucester, who was Edward IV's youngest brother and who was then living with the Neville family at Middleham. He would stay until 1469, when, aged 16, he was declared to be of age. This was also the year that the relationship between his brother, King Edward, and Isabel's father, Lord Warwick, would take a nosedive, and Isabel would be at the centre of the storm. Before I reveal what happened next, if you're enjoying this content, I'd be really grateful if you'd consider giving the video a thumbs up before you go, as this helps YouTube know that you liked it so that they can recommend it to other interested people. For more from me, you can also hit the subscribe button with the notification bell switched on, and that way YouTube will alert you when I upload a new long-form video, short, or community post. You can also find me over on Instagram, where I post every week, and on Patreon, where I provide bonus material including mini podcasts and early access to ad-free videos. These are both linked below for you. A quick thank you to those of you who already support me on Patreon, or by making one-off donations to the channel using the thanks button underneath videos, for your great generosity and support. You'll recall that King Edward and Richard had another surviving brother, George, Duke of Clarence. George was one of those people who wanted more than he had, even when he didn't deserve it, and he fancied himself as king one day, as Edward did not yet have a legitimate son. This left George essentially next in line for the throne, for although Edward did have daughters, there was no precedent in this era for a woman successfully inheriting the throne. If you want to hear about the most famous example of a medieval lady who tried, though, see my video on Empress Matilda, linked on screen and below for you. George wanted a wealthy aristocratic wife to suit his aspirations, and he and Warwick both felt that Isabel, now 17, was the perfect candidate, with Warwick no doubt hoping the end result might be one of his grandchildren on the throne. Edward, though, could not be persuaded to give his consent to the match, probably wanting to limit Clarence and Warwick's power within England and use Clarence to make a useful foreign match. This greatly angered both his cousin and his brother, as Edward himself had squandered his opportunity to make a strategic alliance by marrying the Lancastrian widow Elizabeth Woodville back in 1464. Furthermore, he did this in secret and only admitted to it some time later when Warwick was in the process of trying to arrange the king's marriage to Bonna of Savoy. Having flouted expectations so spectacularly himself, it must have seemed a bit much that he now expected George to toe the line. His little brother and his cousin were to prove just as willing to break the rules when it suited them, though, and events soon took a dangerous turn. The plan to marry George and Isabel to one another was in the works for a long time. In March 1468, Clarence and Warwick obtained a papal dispensation which would overcome the obstacle created by the couple's blood relationship, and the fact that Isabel was the goddaughter of George's mother, which was a genuine impediment in this era. It wasn't until July 1469, however, that the scheme was put into action. In that month, Warwick and George took Isabel to Calais, and, we are told by one source, the twelfth day of the month of July, in the translation of St. Bennet the Abbot, the ninth year of the reign of our sovereign Lord King Edward IV, in the castle of Calais, the said Duke took in marriage Isabel, one of the daughters and heirs of the said Richard Earl of Warwick, which that time was present there, and five other knights of the garter and many other lords and ladies and worshipful knights well accompanied with wise and discreet esquires, in right great number, to the loud praising of God and to the honour and worship of the world. The contrast between Edward's furtive marriage to his queen and George's very public nuptials couldn't have been more stark. It also had much more familial support than the Woodville marriage had ever enjoyed, the ceremony was officiated by the bride's uncle, George Neville, Archbishop of York, and seemingly blessed by the groom's mother, Cecily, who allowed her own minstrels to play at the celebrations, something which has been taken as a tacit approval of the union. The wedding party stayed in Calais for five days. Then Warwick and George, quote, shipped into England, leaving the said Duchess at Calais aforesaid and went himself, and the said Earl, to the city of London, and so forth northward. This was the beginning of a full-scale revolt against Edward. 
The Duke and the Earl defeated the King's forces at the Battle of Edgecote on the 26th of July, and days later they had Edward himself in their custody. As for Isabel, she was either already pregnant or became so very soon after returning from France. Thanks to her father and husband's miscalculations, however, the end result of this pregnancy would be tragic. Within a few months of their coup, it became clear that Warwick and Clarence couldn't rule England in Edward's name and keep the peace, and the king had to be released. There was a show of familial forgiveness, but the situation was very uneasy, and in early 1470, Isabel's father and husband had another go at ousting the monarch. Again, they failed, and this time they had to take Isabel, her mother, and her sister, and flee to France in the middle of April. Edward managed to get orders through to his lieutenant at Calais not to allow his traitorous family to land there, though. And so it was that the 18-year-old Isabel, who should have been at home in her own bed, went into labour on the boat. Philippe de Comines, who was an advisor to Louis XI of France, had this to say of what happened. In the town, meaning Calais, was Warwick's lieutenant, Lord Wenlock, and several of his domestic servants. Instead of welcoming him, they fired several cannon shots at him. While they lay at anchor before the town, the Duchess of Clarence, the Earl of Warwick's daughter, gave birth to a son. It was only with a great deal of difficulty that Lord Wenlock and the others could be persuaded to allow two flagons of wine to be brought to her. The baby, whose gender is actually unknown despite what Comines said because different sources give different information, was either stillborn or lived only a short time, perhaps suggesting that it was premature. The Roos rule said it was buried by Calais, which could mean either buried at sea or taken ashore and interred there. The bedraggled group landed in Normandy on the 1st of May, and with nowhere else to go, Warwick and Clarence now made an alliance with the exiled Margaret of Anjou. It was one which would critically undermine Isabel's own marriage and any pretensions she ever had of being queen. The idea was to have Warwick's younger daughter, the 14-year-old Anne, marry Margaret's son, Edward, Prince of Wales. Warwick would take troops supplied by King Louis of France, who wanted military support against Burgundy in return, to England, depose Edward IV, restore Henry VI, who had been captured and imprisoned in the Tower of London back in 1465, and when it was safe, Margaret, Prince Edward, and his new wife would return to England. This must have been galling for Isabel. It effectively said that her own marriage was a lame duck, of no use to her father, and that he was now putting all his eggs in her little sister's basket. It also meant that Anne would outrank her, first as Princess of Wales, and then, if all went according to plan, as Queen, and that it would be her children who would someday inherit the throne not Isabel's. The plan was soon put into motion. Anne and Edward were betrothed on the 25th of July while they awaited a papal dispensation to allow them to wed, and Warwick and Clarence set off for England, landing there on the 13th of September. They succeeded in deposing Edward IV, who had to flee into exile on mainland Europe along with his youngest brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and Henry VI was freed and put back on the throne in the middle of October. Anne and Lady Warwick stayed behind with the girls' almost in-laws as virtual hostages in France, and Isabel possibly remained with them, though we don't actually know for sure where she was, and later events make it appear that she returned to England separately from them. As with all Warwick and Clarence's scheming, the positive results for them didn't last long. We don't know how Warwick convinced George to agree to the plan to restore Henry, or if there was any convincing at all. George was too far gone with his cousin, it seemed, to ever return to his brother, so he may have been going along with events at this point due to a lack of any other viable option. He was financially compensated by the new Henrican government, but at some point it seems to have dawned on him that he was useless to the new regime, and would never be as well off as he had been as the brother of the king. By now he was just the brother-in-law of the Princess of Wales, which was a real come down by comparison. Always seeking greener pastures, and certainly not burdened with any great sense of loyalty to anyone but himself, he now switched sides again, and in April 1471 he rejoined his brothers, who had returned from exile the previous month, to retake the throne. This left his wife in an unenviable position, with her father and sister on one side of the political divide, and her husband on the other. A sudden death was about to settle the situation for her, though. <laughs> 
On the 14th of April, at the Battle of Barnet, King Edward's forces clashed with those of Richard Earl of Warwick, and Isabel's father was killed. It was the same day that her sister, new brother-in-law, and Margaret of Anjou had returned from France. This group made a concerted effort to carry on the fight by attempting to join forces with Henry VI's uncle, Jasper Tudor, but Edward IV engaged the Prince of Wales and his troops in battle at Tewkesbury on the 4th of May, and the 17-year-old prince was killed. Shortly afterwards, Margaret of Anjou and Anne were taken prisoner from a nearby church in which they had been sheltering, and brought to Edward IV at Coventry on the 11th. The fact that Isabel doesn't seem to have been with him at this point makes me suspect that she was already back at George's side. Her mother, we know, was in sanctuary at Bewley Abbey. Anne was placed in George's custody and sent to live with her sister and brother-in-law, possibly at their house at Cold Harbour. Isabel was now effectively her sister's jailer in many respects, but we have no information as to how the two girls, because really that's all they were, interacted with each other during this time. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, soon made known his desire to marry Anne, which would have given him access to her half of the Warwick inheritance, which George currently controlled as Isabel's husband, and the two brothers fought bitterly over the ex-princess's future. There is a story that George even had Anne disguised as a kitchen maid in one of his houses in order to try to hide her from Richard, and if this is the case, we must wonder what Isabel made of this treatment of her younger sibling. Eventually, though, Richard got his way and married Anne, sometime between March 1472 and July 1474. This put the sisters back on an even footing, both royal duchesses and sisters-in-law to the king, as well as now being sisters-in-law to each other too, just one of the odd little quirks of this level of family intermarriage. The births of Isabel's children help us to track her movements during the final years of her life. By the end of 1472, she was pregnant once more, and her daughter Margaret, later Countess of Salisbury, was born at Farley Castle on the 14th of August, 1473. She was joined by a brother, named Edward after the King, and given the title the Earl of Warwick, who was born a year and a half later, in late February 1475, at Isabel's childhood home, Warwick Castle. Her last child, another boy, called Richard after his uncle Gloucester, arrived in October 1476 at Tewkesbury Abbey, showing just how brief the gaps between medieval aristocratic pregnancies were. It is possible that Isabel attended the reburial of her father and brother-in-law, the Duke of York and the Earl of Rutland, at Fotheringhay in July 1476, and if so, this would likely have been one of her last, if not her final, official engagement. After baby Richard's birth, she seems to have suffered postpartum complications, which ultimately killed her at Warwick Castle on the 22nd of December. She was just 25 years old. Her little son outlived her by a matter of days, dying on the 1st of January 1477. She was buried in Tewkesbury Abbey. Her loss sent George into a death spiral of his own. He accused her maidservant, Anchorette Twino, of having poisoned Isabel and the baby in October, which made no sense given that they didn't die until December and January respectively, and had the woman seized, then tried, found guilty of murder, and executed all in one day. It was judicial murder and usurped the king's power. Further insults to Edward soon followed, leading to George's arrest and dramatic execution by drowning in February 1478, after which he was interred with Isabel. You can hear all the details of this case in my video on his death. Isabel's children met similarly gruesome ends. Her son Edward spent most of his life in prison and was eventually executed by Henry VII in 1499 after supposedly planning to escape and depose the king while her daughter Margaret was beheaded in 1541 on the orders of Henry VIII, in retaliation for the actions of her sons, who did not support his church reforms. Rarely had a family all met such tragic ends. I hope you find this biography of Isabel interesting. Let me know in the comments below what you make of her father and husband's treatment of her, and for more on this period of English history, do check out my Wars of the Roses playlist. I'll be back next week, and until then, keep learning.